Okay, we're recording. So I just have a few other um, housekeeping items. So first of all, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Anna Martin. I work with uh, NCWRA to help coordinate these uh, wonderful forums. They uh, work really hard to bring you guys some pertinent information. And I know uh, that it's a good resource for a lot of people in our area. So we continue um, to strive to make these uh, the best that we can in the virtual environment. Your feedback is always um, extremely important to us, as well as your suggestions for what topics and speakers you want to hear. So um, please keep those coming uh, through our evaluations that um, are linked in the email that I sent. So I know one big uh, draw for these is that um, people can get credit uh, professionally for these forums. And we're very happy to provide that for you. So I've laid out in the email that went out yesterday um, a couple of requirements that we asked for. So there's a sponsor evaluation and then the evaluation for the actual forum. So those are always uh, two things that we look for. But if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer those for you. Uh, let's see what else we've got. I wanted to remind you all that my organization, uh, the Water Resources Research Institute at NC State, is having our own virtual annual conference this year in March. So I'm going to provide a link. If you haven't seen that come through um, any of the various listservs, I feel like I've tried to hit them all, <laughs> but I know there's always more out there. Please do check us out. And uh, I'm going to put that link in the chat right now. We'd love to have you join us. That's going to be March 25th and 26th um, of this year. And those will be afternoon virtual sessions. So we hope you will find some value in attending that. And registration is free. So not a bad deal this year. Um, with that, I am going to turn it over to our official moderator to get us officially started this morning. And this is Mr. Jason Dahl with uh, NCWRA. So with that, Jason, you can take it away. Okay. Thanks for that introduction, Anna. I appreciate it. Um, I'm Jason Dahl. I'm, I'm my day job, I'm with KCI Consulting, uh, but I'm also on the board of NCWRA and, I'm, and as an active member of the program committee helped organize this uh, workshop today. Shout out to all the other folks on the program committee. Thanks for the help. Uh, so today we want to talk about, uh, and I don't want to mess this up, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS. Uh, PFAS is obviously, you've seen it in the news, and it's an it's a important emerging contaminant here in North Carolina. And so uh, we wanted to have a, a session of one of our forums to talk about what's happening, what's some of the latest science with PFAS in terms of contamination and risk. But also not to just leave it at that, we like to organize these forums such that we're also offering uh, solutions. You know, what, given this is where we're at, what are some of our options for what can be done with emerging contaminants like this? Uh, and to tackle this issue, we have two speakers online today. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Heather Stapleton. And she is the Roni, I'm going to, hopefully I pronounce this right, the Roni Rochelle Garcia Johnson, Distinguished Professor at the Nicholas School for the Environment at Duke University. Uh, Dr. Stapleton's research focuses on understanding the fate and transformation of organic contaminants in aquatic systems and indoor environments. So she'll talk to, about, talk to us about some of her recent research uh, that, and the findings she's had right here with PFAS in North Carolina. And then there's Elizabeth Hawley, we'll follow up from there. And Elizabeth is a senior consultant at Geosyntec Consultants with 16 years of experience advancing environmental remediation projects involving site characterization, fate and transport remediation strategies to achieve site closure and litigation support services. Uh, her areas of expertise include PFAS. So she'll be talking to us about solutions, uh, I want to let them run with the ball, and then we'll open it up for questions after both speakers finish, so we're not interrupting anybody, and I'll come back and talk to you at the end. Take it away, Heather. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Let me get my slides up here.
Everyone see those slides okay? We can see those, Heather. Thank you so okay. much. Great. Thank you for confirming. So well, thank you for the invitation to be here today and talk a little bit about the research that we have ongoing in our lab, focusing on PFAS in the Haw River and Jordan Lake and the implications for human exposure in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. So I first wanna um, thank my collaborators. Uh, this, this study is uh, not done individually. It's really done with a large team effort, both at Duke University and our colleagues at NC State University. So I certainly wanna acknowledge Kate Hoffman, Samantha Hall, and Lee Ferguson at Duke University uh, and our collabor collaborators, Jane Hoppen and Detlef Kanapi at NC State University. So what are PFAS? I know Jason just mentioned the, the long acronym for these that stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. These are a very large class of chemicals. Um, here I can say 5,000. Some reports have this closer to 7,000 chemicals that are out there on the market. Unfortunately, a lot of the, the uses are proprietary, so it's not clear exactly how many are out there. But from an industrial perspective, these are a very attractive class of compounds because their chemistry confers strong water stain and grease repellent, repellent properties. So you might think of something like Scotch Guard that's applied to your carpets uh, or the upholstery on your sofa right, to prevent uh, some stains from setting in. So here in this photo, you can see this glass of red wine that was dropped in the carpet. And you notice how the red wine beads up. That's due to the properties of PFAS or these stain repellent compounds. They're also used in food packaging uh, to prevent the package uh, containers from accumulating grease. Um, and they're often used in things like nonstick cookware, it's just a few examples. Uh, there are others here, which I list on this slide on the left. Another application that's received quite a bit of attention is in firefighting foam or what's often called a triple F. So you can see in this image on the bottom, the firefighters are uh, spraying this white foam. Historically, a large number of AFFF formulations have contained PFAS as well, although currently there are um, new formulations that are appearing on the market that are fluorine free. But this has raised a lot of concern about exposures in firefighters um, and even the use of these formulations on military bases due to the impacts on adjacent uh, ecology and adjacent stream systems. On the right here, I have the chemical formulas for the two most common or well-known PFAS that are called PFOS and PFOA. I promise I will not make this a chemistry lecture, but I wanted to point out their structures because you can see there's a large number or there's very um, quite a number of the, the letter F here on the structures that indicates there's a large number of fluorine on the molecules and the presence on the backbone of this molecule is really what confers that uh, grease repellent or water repellent properties. Um, this also leads to strong persistence in the environment, so they're uh, resistant to degradation. And as a consequence, many of these chemicals are often referred to as forever chemicals. And studies have documented their presence and detection uh, in a number of samples. They're ubiquitous, but they're very commonly detected uh, in human tissues and blood, for example. So almost everyone in the general population in the U.S. has PFOS and PFOA in their bodies. This has raised some concern due to the associations with our impacts on human health that have been observed in both uh, animal uh, laboratory studies and human epidemiology studies. Most notable are impacts on thyroid disease, uh, impacts on our body's ability to form and manage lipid and cholesterol and the impacts on our metal metabolism. Some studies are suggesting that PFAS exposure can impact our immune system. So this is our body's ability to fight off disease. Um, in particular, there's been some epidemiology studies that have shown that higher levels of PFAS and blood are associated with lower antibody responses and lower uh, tighter responses to vaccines. Uh, and this is particularly relevant today in all of our concerns about COVID and the, the COVID vaccine being distributed. Uh, the health impacts of PFAS were also documented in this movie called Dark Waters. If any of you have seen this, it stars Mark Ruffalo and Anne Hathaway. And it, uh, it's based on real events that occurred in West Virginia, where a community that was adjacent to a manufacturing facility um, was later identified as having high exposure to these compounds when they were leaking from this facility. And so Mark Ruffalo portrays this lawyer who spent a good portion of his career trying to understand the, um, the role of this company in this exposure. And it was really um, had a big impact on the scientific field because it um, led to a lawsuit where the company actually ended up paying for health studies in this community. It's the first time it's ever been done on this scale. 
And a lot of our knowledge about the impacts of PFAS on human health actually came from that study, which is commonly referred to as the C8 study. Um, so if you haven't seen it, I would recommend watching the movie. So it's not only West Virginia and North Carolina that have problems with PFAS. This is a problem that is nationwide and, and a problem globally. On the left here, you can see this map that I borrowed from the Environmental Working Group. Our link is here on the bottom, but it really highlights, they basically collated lots of data about where PFAS have been detected in water. Uh, some of these are drinking water. You can see the blue circles. Others are areas where the, um, they're adjacent to military sites and PFAS have been identified in these areas. Um, so as you can see, obviously North Carolina has a lot of dots on this map. Uh, as a consequence, there's a lot of interest in understanding what the regulations should be for PFAS, particularly in drinking water. Currently, the EPA has a health advisory established. Uh, it is not enforceable. That is set as 70 nanograms per liter, which is also a parts per trillion, and reflects either PFOA and PFAS individually or the sum of those two. The EPA is in the process of establishing an MCL, a maximum contaminant level, that would be enforceable, but is not in place yet. Um, and I'm actually going to come back to this point towards the end of my talk. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's an issue in North Carolina, and some of you might be familiar with the term Gen X. Uh, Gen X is a type of PFAS. Um, so this received a lot of attention in the media in 2017 and 2018 after researchers at NC State and the EPA here in Research Triangle Park identified Gen X and some other PFAS contaminants in the Cape Fear River, uh, in, in addition, into the, in the drinking water supply, some, some groundwater wells, and the, uh, the public water in Wilmington, North Carolina, as a result of leakage from the Keymore's facility that's in Bladen County. Um, as a result of this contamination, the North Carolina General Assembly did fund um, a statewide academic research consortium called the PFAS Network uh, to further explore PFAS contamination uh, in surface waters throughout the state. So I provided their website here if people are interested in following up that. Uh, I was part of this PFAS network. Um, and as um, a result of that funding, we were interested in looking at PFAS in the research triangle. Uh, in particular, we were really interested, our study was intended to evaluate the utility of point of use water filters in removing PFAS from the tap water. And the study was based in the triangle. And as part of that study, we ended up collecting tap water samples from homes in the area. So our team visited these homes, collected tap water, typically from the kitchen sink, and then an additional water sample from whatever filter that the, the homeowner had in the house. So the graph on the right here that I'm showing you is the results of uh, PFAS measurements in the tap water. So the unfiltered tap water from different uh, utilities around the region. So most of these are um, city water, we had a few well water samples that were very low in PFAS. Um, so it's kind of opposite to the trend we saw out in Fayetteville, for example, where it was a lot of private wells that have been contaminated with Gen X. Here in the triangle, it's really more of the um, surface water sources that are used by our local utilities that have higher PFAS levels. So these uh, measurements reflect the sum total of 11 of the most common PFAS that we measured. So there's quite a bit of variability and I'll point out that this is on a log scale. So these are values in nanograms per liter. But what you can see here is that um, we had eight samples from the, the Pittsburgh and they had the highest concentrations that we measured. So one in particular was at 760 nanograms per liter. Again, to put this in perspective, the EPA health advisory is 70 nanograms per liter for those two PFAS, PFO and PFAS. Um, now the average was closer to 100 nanograms per liter, but there was a quite a bit of variability. And so these samples were collected over almost a year time frame. And then you can see here, Cary um, had the second highest average levels of PFAS in their water. Uh, and what's interesting as we'll talk about is that Pittsburgh pulls their water from the Haw River. The Haw River flows south and empties into Jordan Lake and Jordan Lake is then the source of water for the city of Cary and Apex. Um, so Durham and Raleigh ended up having kind of lower PFAS levels. So it was interesting that they were definitely present um, and it varied over time, which was also interesting. And there are these differences, even in the PFAS patterns we have observed in these tap water samples, but I won't uh, get into that too much here. So why are PFAS in Pittsburgh? It's because they're in the Haw River, as I just indicated. Um, as a result of this study, we were really interested in understanding where the PFAS were coming from and particularly understanding some of the spatial and temporal variability in PFAS levels in the Haw River. 
So we were fortunate enough to get a study funded by Duke University to follow this up. And so in June of 2019, we began weekly water collections along the Haw River, uh, as far north, as, collecting water as far north as Burlington, um, and then as far south uh, into J uh, Jordan Lake here. So there's a couple of sites along the stem of the Haw River, and then we had two sites that we've been sampling along Jordan Lake, one of which is located very close to the water intake for the town of Cary. And our hope is, is that by generating this data, we have a better understanding <clears throat> of the drivers of the PFAS concentrations in the water uh, and how that relates to human exposure. And we are working with some hydrologists to understand what this means for mass flows um, and how this relates to um, the presence and movement of PFAS in other regions of North Carolina. So I wanted to first talk about the, um, our northernmost sites up near Burlington. Two of our sites were specifically selected to understand whether there's a contribution potentially from this wastewater treatment plant, the East Burlington Wastewater Treatment Plant. You can see here in this uh, satellite image, and here you have Route 70 that passes over the Haw River <clears throat> and the Burlington Wastewater Treatment Plant. Hopefully we can see my mouse moving here as highlighted here. Um, and they have an output right uh, into the river just north of this bridge here. So these yellow rectangles indicate the sites where our team parks and then they walk over to the river and they collect a surface water sample. So just north of this water treatment plant and one just south of this water treatment plant on the same day within 20 to 30 minutes of each other um, and only separated by a couple hundred uh, yards here. So here what I'm presenting, and I know this is kind of a complicated graph, but um, presenting, presenting the total concentrations of PFAS we have measured at these two sites that I just showed you over time. Uh, so the height of these bars represents the total concentration of PFAS. So this is the sum of 13 PFAS now in nanograms per liter, starting in June of 2019 and going through July of 2020 <clears throat> in this case. And so uh, the blue bars represent the total concentration at that upstream site. And then the orange bars represent the concentrations at that downstream site. So the first thing you can notice is there's a lot of variability over time. Uh, and we have seen that. And I don't think that's all attributed to differences in uh, flow rates or evaporations. Um, some of that seems to be attributed to direct inputs at this location. Um, so what you can see is there's, uh, particularly in 2019, <clears throat> when we started, there's a difference here in the height of the blue and the orange bars, where they're much higher in the orange bars relative to the blue bars, suggesting that there was a significant input between those two points, which we uh, hypothesized could be the East Burlington Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, and then as you kind of, you know, move into the summer 2019 and fall, the levels increased. Um, and then there's a few dates where the levels are exactly the same. So September 30th of 2019, the values just directly up and downstream are almost the same. And then we kind of move into 2020 and that's when COVID happened, obviously. Um, so it's really hard for us to tease apart the impacts of COVID versus um, the input of PFAS to these streams. But we did see the levels seem to decrease in the winter. Um, we've seen this pattern a couple of times in the past, starting in 2018, where they seem to be higher in the, the summer and fall, decreasing in the winter. Uh, in this case, over 2020, we didn't see that big increase that we've seen in other years, but you can still see that there's this difference between the blue and the orange bars. Although beginning around June and July, and even in through, um, we do have some more data now from September, October, and November of 2020, we're starting to see the height of those bars be equal, suggesting that the um, there's not as strong of a contribution uh, near that location as we have seen in the past. Um, and so, as I said before, there's a lot of things that have changed over the last year. So it's unclear what's driving this at this time, right? But if that was the sum total, but let's look at two PFAS, uh, specific PFAS. So PFAS is plotted on the top. Again, it's the same layout. So the height of the bars represent the concentration, but in this case for these specific PFAS, and notice that the scales are different, very different for PFAS versus PFHXA, which is a different PFAS. So for PFAS in the top, the highest concentration we've observed is close to 20 nanograms per liter. Um, and the height of these bars is almost the exact same uh, almost every time we measure them, suggesting that there's not a big change in the concentration between those two sampling points. Uh, but we see the opposite for PFHXA. That's where um, it's much higher concentration. So you can see here in September of 2019, it was over 400 nanograms per liter uh, just downstream of that wastewater treatment plant. Um, so it looks like that there's a differences in the input of PFAS at this location that we see over time. 
right? So again, these big peaks in 2019 over the summer and fall, decreasing throughout the winter. Um, and then lately in 20, at the end of 2020, uh, we've been seeing lower concentrations overall um, and similar concentrations at those two sampling sites. Okay, um, I also wanted to kind of show some of the spatial variability. So here I've pulled out data for PFHXA. I pulled this one out specifically because it's the most abundant, typically the most abundant PFAS in the water as we've been measuring these samples or analyzing these samples. So here I'm showing the same format, format where the height of the bar is the concentration, in this case, the PFHXA levels over time. But the bars here represent the three different sampling sites uh, on each date. Right, so the blue bar now indicates levels at that wastewater treatment plant or just south of the wastewater treatment plant, um, so the downstream site. And then we're plotting the levels at Bynum on the Haw River and the second circle here in red on the map. And that's very close to the water intake for the city of Pittsburgh. And then I'm also showing you the values for um, Jordan Lake right next to the overpass, the 64 overpass and close to the water intake for the town of Cary and Apex. Um, so when we started this in 2019, we typically saw the highest concentrations in the blue bars, which was up closer to that wastewater treatment plant. Um, and you can see then you would see decreasing levels in the orange and the gray bars as you got closer to Bynum and down to Jordan Lake. Um, but that varies depending on the time. So if we were to look at the data from August 2019, you see that the gray bar is the highest over 300 nanograms per liter in this case. Um, and we saw that again here in September of 2019. And so um, we've been having conversations with um, Detlef Kanapi's group at NC State and others um, who've been, who have conducted monitoring of PFAS in the Haw River uh, back in 2013 and 2012, and they observed some similar trends. And it almost appears to us that there might be these um, you know, inputs of PFAS that kind of a plug almost that then travels downstream. And sometimes we capture that plug at a point downstream of the water system. Um, but I'd say in general, we typically see the higher levels up near Burlington that decrease, but it does depend on the time. And this is where I think using this data and the hydroelectric model will be helpful to us moving forward. Okay, so the question then is how does this impact exposure for communities that are pulling their water, their drinking water from these locations? Uh, we were really interested in understanding this. And as a consequence, we conducted a small study in Pittsburgh to understand um, whether or not the, the, the um, population had higher exposure compared to the general US population. So in 2019, we recruited 49 individuals living in Pittsburgh. Um, each one of these participants provided both a drinking water sample. Uh, the, so we actually asked them to collect whatever water they were drinking, which says sometimes is the tap water and sometimes it was going through a filter. And we had a phlebotomist on hand who actually drew a blood sample. And we collected these samples two months apart just to understand the differences in the water levels in particular because we knew that they were fluctuating. So this began in November of 2019. Uh, and then we had a sampling in uh, January, February of 2020. So I'm just gonna first start with a snapshot of the drinking water results from these 49 participants living in Pittsburgh. Um, so here the concentrations of total PFAS are plotted from lowest to highest in this case. Um, and you can see the first uh, nine values here are actually below our detection limits. Some of these were bottled water because some of the participants in our study had been concerned about the water. So they were drinking bottled water. So that's what we analyzed. And some participants had very good filters in their home that removed almost all of the PFAS. But you can see there was quite a bit of variability in people um, living in Pittsburgh. You know, some count the medians are usually around 100 nanograms per liter, but they um, are as high as 452 nanograms per liter. So a lot of this variability is really driven by, I believe, is, is driven by the types of filters that are present in the home. And then values in January were, were similar, not all that different, but a little bit lower overall. I'm not going to spend as much time talking about that for the sake of time. I'm going to move on and just talk about what we found in the blood samples. So we have a method that can um, detect 13 different PFAS, and we looked for these in the blood samples. So they were detected in every single blood sample that we analyzed. On the right is a pie chart, just kind of reflecting the more dominant or most abundant PFAS that were measured in the blood of these participants. So PFAS and PFOA were most abundant, and the third most common was PFHXS. Um, that's actually pretty similar to what is seen in the uh, US population. And, 
there was very little to no difference in the concentrations between the two different time points. Right, but to put this in perspective of how this compares to uh, blood levels in the general US population, we compared our measurements for Pittsburgh to data that's available from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention through what's known as their NHANES uh, program. So this is a representative sample of several thousand people that are um, recruited and their blood collected to understand levels in the general population. So in each of these graphs on the right, I'm plotting the individual PFAS we measured in the blood samples. The red box indicates the distribution of data measured in November of 2019 from the participants. And then the blue is the levels in January, February of 2020. And so first of all, as you can see that there's not a lot of difference between the two different time points uh, in these 49 individuals. The line in the middle of these box whisker plots represents the median concentration for these Pittsburgh residents. And what you can notice is that's very similar to this dashed line that's called, that's labeled Wilmington, North Carolina. And that's true in all four of these uh, PFAS that we're presenting here. So in, in the case here, all of these were very similar to the median levels and distribution observed in blood collected from participants living in Wilmington, North Carolina that were impacted by that um, release from the Keymore's facility or presumed release from the Keymore's facility. Um, but in both cases, they are higher than blood PFAS levels measured in the general US population, which is represented by this second dashed line. Um, and then do note that some of these have different scales. Here, they're all the same scale. The next slide will be a little bit different and they are on a log scale. PFAS was the most abundant uh, PFAS that we measured here. Here are three additional PFAS we measured in the blood samples. Um, in this case, PFDA, these are found at much lower concentrations in general. Again, no difference between the two time points, but again, much higher than the general US population. In this case, about five times higher than what we see in the general US population. PFHXA in the middle, this is the PFAS that is the most abundant PFAS in the Haw River water system and often in Jordan Lake as well. Here you do see a difference between the two different time frames. It was higher in early uh, 2020 as compares compared to late 2019. Um, and you can see we don't have any dashed lines for comparison in this graph. And that's because this is actually very rarely detected in the general US population because exposure levels are much lower in the general population. And it was not detected in the Wilmington population. This last PFAS on the right here called PFHPA, um, you can see that the plots look a little different. And that's because this was not detected in 100% of the samples detected about 50% in the late 2019 and about 60 to 70% in early 2020. Uh, but in both cases, this was also very similar to what was measured in the Wilmington cohort. So what we see is that the blood, love, blood PFAS levels for the Pittsburgh residents were actually very similar to what's been seen in Wilmington with the one exception of PFHXA. So then we wanted to ask the question, well, does that mean the drinking water is the primary source of this exposure? Um, now we had drinking water samples collected on the same day the blood, level, blood samples were collected. Um, we first thought about comparing those directly, but to, that creates um, a few problems because these chemicals have very long lifetimes in our body. So um, the estimated half-lives for several of these, particularly the ones that are most abundant that we measured in the blood are on the order of years. So on the right here, um, just giving a theoretical example, right? So if we just looked at PFAS, for example, if we measured PFAS uh, in the serum or blood of an individual at 25 nanograms per gram, and let's assume that all exposure stopped, that there was no more exposure, um, they had a clean source of drinking water and all of their exposures were removed, it would take 3.4 years before that concentration would drop to 50%, right? Or around 12 nanograms per gram. It would take another seven years before it dropped to 25% of that level, right? Not until 11 years later is it 12% of the level, right? So these chemicals have very long half-lives. So what's probably most important is to look at what their drinking water levels were in the past and not the day of collection. So to do that, we had to like look into the literature and pull up some reports from other studies. Um, so what I'm showing you here are the PFOA levels that we measured in the Haw River. Um, and we had some data from 2018 going through uh, 2020 here. And um, so the blue bars are what we measured in our study. There's this dashed line on the top here, the, the red long dashes representing the measurements reported in this 2006 paper from Nakayama et al. So these were researchers at Research Triangle Park EPA 
where they collected samples on the Ha River and they measured PFOA at around 200 nanograms per liter, per liter back in 2006. Um, a more recent measurement in 2013 from the group at NC State measured a value around 34 nanograms per liter, which actually is somewhat similar to what we measured if you looked at the, the average over this time frame. And if you compare that to the date where the blood samples were collected here, right? So um, these previous measurements were much higher than what was measured on the date in which we collected the blood samples. Now that's in contrast to a chemical like PFHXA. This is the one that is most abundant in the water samples on the Haw River today. Again, here's the data that we measured, the blue bars from 2018, 2019, 2020. Again, there's this variability that we see over time. But here you see a different trend when you look at back uh, historically at the levels in the Haw River. So if you look at the report from 2006, the levels of this compound at that time were around 14 nanograms per liter. In 2013, the NC State group measured a value of around 48 nanograms per liter. So both of these are lower than what we're measuring today. And this one has a much shorter half-life in our body, which is estimated to be a couple months, right? So, and then here's the value for the day we collected the blood samples. So in thinking about this, we thought it was really important to look at the exposure levels in the water in the past. So we used the 2013 data. And what we did is we actually modeled this. There is an online pharmacokinetic model where you can predict what a blood level is for PFAS based on a drinking water uh, concentration. And so what I'm showing you on the right here the, are the um, measured versus modeled levels of blood PFAS. So the blue bars represent what we actually measured, the median levels measured in this Pittsburgh population. And then the orange bars are the predicted or model output, assuming a drinking water concentration level measured back in 2013. So we took the data from 2013 and put that into the model. And you can see actually that they're very similar. So this does suggest to us that drinking water is the primary source of exposure um, that we're measuring in, in the Pittsburgh population. Um, and let's then put this in context, you know, what we're measuring in the drinking water versus um, the health advisory and versus some other MCLs that have been established in certain states. So at the beginning, when I was talking about this, I mentioned that EPA does have a health advisory of 70 nanograms per liter. It's non-enforceable. This is for PFOA, PFAS, or the sum of the PFOA and PFAS. Um, as I said, they're working on an MCL. Um, however, several states uh, decided to take uh, the initiative to establish their own maximum contaminant levels. New Jersey was the first. Um, and their risk assessors evaluated the data and decided that 70 was not protective enough. And they established a drinking water guideline of 14 nanograms per liter for PFOA. And for comparison, I've put in the maximum level we've measured in Pittsburgh drinking water, which for PFOA was 48 nanograms per liter. So it's less than the EPA health advisory, but it is higher than the MCLs established by New Jersey and Michigan, you can see here. Some states have also taken the steps uh, like Vermont and Massachusetts to not look at just PFAS individually, but look at the sum total because we are not exposed to these one at a time. We are exposed to these um, as a class, as a mixture. So some states have established a drinking water standard for the sum total of these five or six PFAS that I've listed on the bottom row here, right? Which is at 20 nanograms per liter. And if you compare that to the sum total on the maximum total that's been measured in Pittsburgh, it's 225, so 10 times higher than those standards, those standards that have been established in other states. So you can see how it um, you know, compares to the regulations that are set in other states. Um, so I know this has generated a lot of questions about what this means for human health and the health risks, uh, particularly for residents in Pittsburgh. Right now, we're just evaluating exposure, so we cannot really say at this time what this means for health risks. Um, and to put this in context of what we're measuring in Pittsburgh versus, versus what was measured in this West Virginia population that was highlighted in the Dark Waters movie, these levels are lower than that was measured in that study. They're about four times lower than the West Virginia community. In that community, exposure was associated with um, the risk for certain cancers, testicular cancer and kidney cancer in particular. Um, I know the state has been evaluating the cancer statistics by county and looking at the county level, there doesn't seem to be an elevated um, detection or incidence of those cancers um, out there but in Chatham County. But um, again, Chatham County is really large relative to Pittsburgh. So I think there's more we need to do to understand what the health risks are 
Um, we are hoping to do more research focused on the health risk, um, collaborating with NC State University and Jane Hoppen in particular, who's been evaluating exposures in the Wilmington and Fayetteville areas. And we hope to be able to expand that to Pittsburgh and assess health risks in that area. But one point I wanna leave on, I know I'm kind of running out of time is, um, what strikes me um, is, as being very interesting is that the levels we're measuring in Pittsburgh are very similar to the levels measured in Wilmington. Um, now the levels we measured are for these legacy PFAS, so PFOA, PFAS, PFA, PFHXS. Um, Wilmington is uh, thought of as being impacted by that Chemors facility, but Chemors was released, releasing Gen X and some of these other novel, newer types of PFAS. If you look at the legacy PFAS, it seems likely that those sources are actually upstream. So it's quite possible that these PFAS that are in the Haw River are making their way down all the way into Wilmington. And that's why these exposure levels are so similar. And as a consequence, this suggests that any community pulling, drink, pulling their drinking water or sourcing their drinking water from the, the Cape Fear River in between these would also potentially have similar exposures to PFAS. And if you estimate how many people are involved, that's about 10% of North Carolina's population or 1 million people that could be impacted with similar exposures. So um, these are just a summary of some of the main points. Um, we do know that PFAS are present in the Haw River and in the Jordan Lake. This is leading to higher exposures in the Pittsburgh community and we hypothesize could be leading to higher exposures in other communities in North Carolina, um, which probably deserves some more attention. Um, I won't go into these details on this. I know I'm over time, but if people are interested in our um, findings from evaluating point of use water filters, we do have a fact sheet and information on our website um, about the different types of filters and how well they remove PFAS. So I just want to thank certainly all of our collaborators, all of our participants. Um, I particularly want to thank Kateri Salt Gunderson, who's a hydrologist who's been working with us, um, and the, uh, our funding uh, sources as well. So I will stop there. Thank you. And I know we'll take questions probably after uh, the next talk. Yes, uh, thank you, Heather. That was uh, fascinating. Uh, I'm gonna. I see a lot of questions coming in in the chat. Uh, that's awesome. I'm glad you guys are engaged. We're gonna hold questions till after Elizabeth does her presentation, and then we'll have a Q and A session, and we'll go through those. I want to let everybody know I had a little glitch with Zoom right at the beginning of Heather's uh, presentation, and so. I had to log out and log back in so I could see the presentation again. And I lost the first couple questions that were asked uh, before I, uh, when I did that. So if uh, those questions, if you could ask them again, if we don't get to them, I'd be grateful. But with that, and Elizabeth, take it away. Jason this, Jason, this is Anna. I was just gonna let you know that I actually do have those questions. Um, okay. I'm, so uh, we can get you we, on board and straighten out as soon as uh, Elizabeth presents. Sounds Come good. On. Thank you. Um, how about now? Can you hear me now? Hi, Elizabeth. We can hear you and we can see oh, your okay. slides. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so good morning. Um, I'm Elizabeth Hawley. I work at GSM Tech Consultants in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, along with some co-authors, John Merrill and Rula Deeb, also in the Bay Area office. And then with um, Balaji Sashasai, who is the project engineer in our Chicago office. And I, I just want to say up front, um, particularly following Heather's talk, which is you know so focused in North Carolina, I, I know that Geosyntec is working at the Kemmerer's Fayetteville facility in North Carolina, but I'm not working on that project or really on any PFAS projects in the state. Um, so the views that I have in this talk really don't relate to that site. Um, what I am going to be talking about today is, is listed here on the outline slide, and I want to get started by talking about some of the current challenges with PFAS treatment, and then discuss some of the established PFAS treatment technologies before looking ahead to some of the more innovative technologies that are currently being developed and tested in the laboratory. And in particular, I wanted to focus on a lines of evidence approach that Geosyntec developed for assessing treatment efficacy. So how well are some of these new technologies working? How do we measure success? 
And I'm going to briefly describe an example of an innovative treatment technology that could be further evaluated and developed within this framework. So moving now to the PFAS treatment challenges, um, as Heather mentioned, the uh, PFAS are highly stable. They can partially degrade to form stable PFAS. For example, longer chain compounds like PFOS and PFOA, which can be you know, thermally stable at really high temperatures up to you know, 600 degrees Celsius. These compounds are also highly stable under chemical conditions. So under oxidizing conditions, they don't break down under like hydro hydroxyl radical chemistry using peroxide, for example. They don't readily biodegrade. They are recalcitrant in the environment. And because they're water soluble, not particularly volatile, what this means for treatment is more limitations and some fewer options for using established treatment technologies that we would consider for other contaminants, fewer options for effective treatment. And I think also it translates to higher treatment costs compared to what we think of for you know, other common uh, environmental contaminants. So this slide shows, um, this is a graphic taken from the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council or ITRC PFAS team. Um, they have a new technical and regulatory guidance document that's available online. From a treatment perspective, you know, there are over 6,000 different PFAS compounds grouped in different classes and groups and subgroups. Um, and because these compounds are typically present in mixtures and products and in the environment, and we have limited analytical techniques um, and internal standards for quantifying concentrations, you know, from a treatment perspective, we're, we're going to really need to understand which PFAS we're targeting and which PFAS we can target by the available analytical techniques. And I think also to be aware of the partial degradation of some of the polyfluorinated substances to form the perfluorinated substances that are more stable. Um, another challenge is changing or uncertain numerical targets. So when you're de designing a treatment system and evaluating cost and feasibility, you can arrive at different decisions depending on which compounds of interest you are focused on. If you're focused just on PFOS and CFOA versus the, the general class or some of the shorter chain compounds. And a big a component of that is what is your effluent requirement? Um, what sorts of factors of safety can you incorporate? Obviously, the closer you get to the laboratory reporting limits, the more difficult it is going to be to operate reliably, and the less time you're going to have to assess treatment system performance. So that affects your design and the subsequent cost or how much the factor of safety you need to be building in. Um, one of the new frontiers, I think, for many states is in setting these criteria for surface water. Um, there's been a wide range of target values that have been published that vary depending on the beneficial use of the receiving waters, um, whether that's used for, as a drinking water supply or for fish, fishing and fish consumption or whether it's, you know, freshwater or marine environments. And I think that typically, you know, the, the human health fish consumption risk pathway is, has some of the lowest values associated with it, followed by you know, the range that we see for drinking water. And then in some cases, you know, much higher numbers for direct aquatic life ecotoxicity values. Um, and again, with a range depending on the particular species of concern. But just to illustrate the, the magnitude of the, the range that we're talking about, um, a recent ESTCP report um, which I have referenced here on this slide, summarized the hazardous concentrations for freshwater and marine environments. And for PFOS, the hazardous concentration at 5% was 5,850 nanograms per liter, which is several order, orders of magnitude higher than the, the drinking water threshold. And I think that these surface water quality criteria will in turn have an impact on what the criteria are for groundwater in, in areas where the, that water is not being used as drinking water. 
Um, one of the, um, so I guess moving on now to the established treatment technologies, looking at what technologies are in place today for PFAS. Typically, the drinking water treatment or just water treatment in general rely on sequestration and removal rather than destruction. Um, so for water treatment, the ITRC identified a few technologies for PFAS compounds, carbon absorption, resin absorption, and you know, membrane treatment or reverse osmosis. And reverse osmosis in particular is typically used for drinking water treatment applications or advanced wastewater treatment should be much less common for remediation projects. Uh, technologies that are not effective for PFAS would include air sparging, air stripping, and then there are technologies that are difficult to apply to PFAS effectively and may not be effective for all PFAS, and those would include you know, chemical reduction, chemical oxidation, um, biological treatment. For soils, there's a variety of different management approaches, but they typically consist of excavation followed by landfill dis disposal or incineration, uh, or treating soils to stabilize the PFAS in place, and more acting like a surface barrier or a cover to kind of reduce infiltration and contact with surface water. And then in terms of developing technologies for soil and other solid media would include soil washing, uh, and thermal destruction. And then when we talk about in-situ treatment approaches, we're typically also talking about adsorption and sequestration methods rather than destructive technologies. So there's several carbon-based amendments that can be added to sequester PFAS in place and reduce mass flux. Um, some of the trademark products include, you know, Plumstoff, Rembind, Matt Care is used in Australia. There's more detail about this in the ITRC guidance. Um, this is just one example. There was um, some um, publications on a pilot test that was conducted at Camp Grayling in Michigan. They used plume stop injections to target a, an area where there was commingled PFAS and chlorinated volatile organic compounds. And as I've shown here in the plot, the uh, PFAS concentrations in wells that were 60 and 16 feet down gradient in this pilot study declined from concentrations of, of approximately 130 nanograms per liter to non-detect within a few months, and we're still non-detect after about 20 months of monitoring. And they're going to be continuing the monitoring to assess longevity. So these Approaches typically use injection-based approaches to deliver amendments or could be mixing into the surface soils with standard excavation um, equipment. Um, they could also be employed as a barrier configuration or like a horizontal reactor configuration, um, but theoretically a, a barrier configuration you set up down gradient could require um, basically replacement, taking out the barrier and disposing of those spent materials in the future. Um, most of the PFAS treatment that's in place today is ex situ. So it uses granular activated carbon, ion exchange, or both. Um, and these technologies typically are effective in sequestering PFAS to non-detect concentrations for some period of time. And then, um, you know, the resin can be spent and, and at some point this change out was, is required. And that, that point depends quite a bit on the PFAS of interest. So we typically see the shorter chain PFAS eluting first and PFAS that have the carboxylate groups such as PFOA eluting before those with the sulfonate groups. Um, some differences between GAC and ion exchange uh, include the residence time for granular activated carbon requires a much longer residence time of an order of 10 to 15 minutes compared to ion exchange, which is typically, you know, two to three minutes of residence time. And it, 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 there are also hybrid systems where the GAC is effectively used in front of the ion exchange resin to capture the organics and that thereby ex extend the lifetime of the carbon. There's a number of different factors that can influence the performance of these treatment systems, including the matrix, the water quality matrix, the 
co contaminants or other anions that are present in the water, the mixture of different PFAS that are present. Um, and so there's typically site specific or water quality specific testing that is done in the form of fence or column studies to um, get information that's needed to uh, accurately des to design a system, predict the technology performance, and predict the frequency of change out and operating costs up front. Uh, this is a diagram from the ICRC training that talks about single-use selective uh, ion exchange resins. So most of the ion exchange resins in these systems that are in place are single-use resins, and they're typically incinerated after use. Um, the other option would be to regenerate the spent ion exchange resin on site and then to reuse it. Um, so there are secondary wastes that are associated with these systems for, as I mentioned, for the ion exchange, there's the single-use resins typically incinerated after use. And if you do use a regenerable ion exchange product, then that will produce a, the regenerant waste stream. Um, that can be distilled to reduce the volume, and then it produces, you know, minimizes the volume of waste, but produces this concentrated still bottom waste. For granular activated carbon, typically the spent gas is, is shipped back to the vendor and it's reactivated at high temperature to dis destroy the PFAS. Um, the systems that are used for that uh, vary by location, but it's typically um, a like a rotary kiln furnace with an afterburner and a wet scrubbing system. And then finally, there can be waste that's associated with pretreatment processes that come ahead of the GAC and ion exchange, such as spent bag filters, or if there are membranes in place ahead of GAC and ion exchange, there could be a reject stream from the, the filter, the membrane filter. Pretreatment, we've found, is, has been really critical to the success of these systems um, because both of the both GAC and ion exchange can be influenced by competing compounds, particularly carbon and iron. Um, but there's also, you know, sites with co-contaminants like volatile organic compounds or petroleum and hydrocarbons, and pretreatment may be needed to, to manage that as well. Overall, the volume of the waste can vary depending on the process from, you know, 3 to 10 percent, um, again, depending on whether solids management is included with that. And there's been definite interest within the industry in coming up with better treatment options for these waste products and for concentrated PFAS, you know, again, with the end goal of mineralizing PFAS. But, you know, each step in these treatment train approaches adds to the complexity of the system and to the cost and, you know, results in higher energy consumption and in some cases perhaps a higher carbon footprint. And that would need to be considered as well. So moving now to some of the data that we get to inform treatability, this is an example of a breakthrough curve that could be generated. This is a combination of gas ion exchange system. And vendors can provide kind of general breakthrough curves for different PFAS compounds, assuming different influent water quality parameters or if that analytical information is available. And, and predict kind of at what point in bed volume in, in the lifetime of the system, you would see some of these compounds eluding. So if you're focused primarily on PFOS and PFOA, the PFOA would elute first from these predictions. Um, but depending on the media that's being used, the type of, of sorbent and resin, and depending on the site-specific mixture of PFAS, you know, you could have other compounds eluding prior to this. So for example, at, at AFFF, Firefighting areas, you could see, uh, you'd expect to see earlier breakthrough of some of the shorter chain compounds or compounds like 6,2-FGS. Um, this plot should, is just kind of another way of looking at PFAS compounds in terms of their hydrophobicity and their solubility. Um, so the compounds that are more soluble and have lower affinities for the organic carbon are harder to treat using GAC and they have faster breakthrough. Um, so in, you know, in this case, PFOS um, would be easier to treat than PFOA, which is more highly soluble and hydrophilic. 
And then when you get into applications like stormwater, you can also have, you know, some of these compounds associated with particles or have been dissolved, and that can make it easier to remove those compounds as well. Um, the planning committee uh, asked me to speak a bit more on stormwater rather than remediation, since I believe that would be of greater interest to this group. So just as an example for stormwater, when we're thinking about stormwater, there's a range of different occurrence values. This is just a plot showing the range of occurrence um, concentrations that have been published from various studies. Um, it's shown on a log scale uh, relative to some potential treatment target goals. So in purple here, kind of toward the top, are the aquatic ecotoxicity values that I mentioned from the recent CERDIP study. The hazardous concentration five and 1% are shown here in purple. Um, the 1% value is typically used for threatened and endangered species. And then the drinking water, the range of drinking water advisory levels and MCLs are showing the 70 nanograms per liter of human health advisory level from EPA as well as the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, MCL. Um, and, and those are shown here in orange. And then the dashed line is the typical method detection limit. Um, and in, in this case, there's also, you know, sometimes even more conservative kind of theoretical levels that have been published, for example, from the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, with their values for seafood ingestion um, are below the method detection limit. And for comparison at sites with that have been impacted by FFS, you know, concentrations of, of PFAS can be around or above, you know, 10 to the fourth. So, you know, that obviously where what standards you're trying to meet, what occurrence the data you have can make a big difference on setting the stage for what treatment technologies you're going to be considering. Uh, other design considerations for stormwater, um, unlike drinking water, groundwater treatment systems or remediation systems, there's highly variable flow rates for stormwater treatment systems. Um, and at least in the West, there's you know, typically episodic wet dry cycling and the need for equalization storage. Um, the design storm that is used as the basis for the sizing varies. Uh, it's common to use the 80, 85th percentile storm event or 80% capture of a 10-year storm event as the design storm. And there can be a real trade-off or potential for cost savings if there's a way to optimize the storage volume versus the treatment system flow rate. So the ability to, to store stormwater and to kind of normalize those flows is can be critical to um, some cost savings. And then the matrix of stormwater can be different from groundwater. So for example, it typically has much higher turbidity and dissolved organic carbon concentrations, meaning that pretreatment is really gonna be critical to treatment system performance. Um, as with groundwater and other systems, you typically need site-specific studies to be used as a basis for design. Um, and in general, I think there are fewer systems that are operating for PFAS in stormwater, it's more common to have groundwater or drinking water treatment systems. Um, so as we get in more information, I think it will be easier to generalize from one site to another. Um, what does it mean for cost? Um, so this is an example of a treatment train that we've been using for stormwater treatment that has been really effective it's working great. It's achieving more than four orders of magnitude reduction. The target concentrations are PFOS and PFOA. Um, the effluent concentrations are typically you know, below method detection limits, although we've seen some values in the, the double digits on occasion, um, typically with you know, variations in the influent concentration. Capital cost. Um, just sort of as an order of magnitude or rule of thumb, uh, five to seven thousand per GPM, uh, and then annual O and M costs similar, uh, two to four thousand per GPM. So you can see that the O and M can can quickly catch up and eclipse the capital cost. Um, and I think optimizing that and, and designing systems with the long term um, operation maintenance needs in mind um, is. It's definitely smart. 
In this system, we're using uh, ion exchange in addition to, to GAC. And the reason for that is, you know, the total organic carbon and other organics like petroleum hydrocarbons at this site can have a significant impact on treatment and result in premature breakthrough. So using the ion exchange resin downstream of the GAC gives you better utilization of the GAC um, and allows us to um, potentially reduce the overall O&M cost by, by better utilizing the GAC and the ion exchange media. media. Um, in general, the, the GAC is better suited for removal of the longer chain, like hydrophobic PFAS, and then the ion exchange it can remove both the longer and the shorter compounds through both adsorption and ion exchange. So if you're looking for more information on treatment technologies, here's a few references. Uh, first, the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, or ITRC, PFAS report. Um, if you're not familiar with ITRC, it's an organization that brings uh, individuals together from various states and environmental agencies to work cooperatively and develop guidance and training and essentially break down barriers to using innovative solutions that are technically sound. It helps to advance the industry in that way. Um, they offer some free training webinars if you prefer that to reading online. Um, there is a training coming up. It's a PFAS roundtable that's focused on AFFF and PFAS treatment technology. That's on April 6th, and you can sign up from their website. Um, and then the guidance document offers information on a lot of different PFAS topics, so it goes far beyond treatment. If you're working on a PFAS project, I'd suggest becoming familiar with that. Um, the second initiative that I have called out to be aware of is newer and it's still kind of a work in progress and that's a project that's funded by um, the Department of Defense Research and Development Organizations, the CERTUP and ESTCP. And that project's being led by the Water Research Foundation to develop life cycle assessment treatment tools. They are requesting cost and performance data from different PFAS treatment systems that are up and running to kind of aid in the development of this tool and are hoping to expand on, you know, pr you know, providing a tool that will help you assess cost and performance as well as you know, life cycle um, comparison of, of carbon footprint and energy usage as well. So if you're interested in that or if you have data to contribute, you can reach out to Ken and Ozekin at the Water Research Foundation. And then last, I um, just wanted to mention EPA's new um, brand new interim guidance on PFAS destruction and disposal. Um, and this basically presents a review of some of the more innovative technologies for destruction and disposal. The interim guidance was released in December, and I believe that the public comment for that just closed. The public comments are also posted online. It looks like they got uh, over 60 different sets of comments. So we'll see um, how that evolves over time. And they did incorporate some of the findings in that report from the PFAS. So EPA has a PFAS Innovative Treatment Technologies or PIT program. Um, and some of the findings from that and their recommendations are incorporated into the guidance. So that takes us to the, the third and final section of the talk, which is looking at treatment frontiers and innovative technologies. I mentioned EPA's focus and funding um, and investments in this. Third of ESTCP on the DOD side has funded a lot of projects focused on PFAS destruction. Um, and each project has a web page. This is just an example of some of the projects that Geosyntec has led or supported. And so you can go on their website and browse the project titles. Third of ESTCP also has a webinar series that you can sign up for if there are PFAS topics coming up. That's right on there front page. Um, but in 2018 alone, for example, they funded 29 projects that were related to PFAS treatment. Um, some of the common themes in these project topics, um, they've been funding and are interested in promoting the development of in-situ and ex-situ approaches. Um, the focus has primarily been on destruction rather than sequestration, but there are projects um, that intend to improve that as well. 
Uh, and also looking at treatment trains, so technologies that are destructive and could be used in conjunction with other technologies. And then this last bullet um, is really focused on confirming treatment efficacy. Um, this project lines of evidence to assess effectiveness of PFAS remedial technologies um, is what I'm going to be focusing on next um, to share some of our project findings there. <clears throat> so the principal investigator for this project is my co-author, um, Dr. Rula Deeb of Geosyntech, and we're collaborating with several academic researchers, including Jennifer Field of Oregon State University, um, Chris Higgins from the Colorado School of Mines, and then Dr. David Sedlak from University of California at Berkeley. And all three of those have been leading PFAS-related research in the past. The objective of this project was really to come up with lines of evidence and decision tools and metrics for better uh, assessing the performance of PFAS treatment technologies. And some of the outcomes of this project <laughs> included development of several lines of evidence. We ended up with three main lines of evidence for whether treatment technologies are effective, as well as some best practices and then other considerations. And we have drafted some tools like a technology evaluation checklist. Um, we plan to publish some technology evaluations along with the checklist this spring. And for project completion, we, we just submitted our final report to CERT up and it's been accepted for publication. So that should be coming out shortly on their website. <clears throat> and then we also have some draft fact sheets that are on each line of evidence and those will be published as well. So the lines of evidence that we came up with as a group, first line of evidence that your technology is working for PFAS um, would be a decrease in target PFAS concentrations. But some of the uh, subtleties in this, and you know, certainly the term target PFAS needs to be defined and kind of agreed upon up front based on the project objectives and needs. And that can definitely vary based on the, the scope of the project and the purpose. For a lot of the research projects that are funded under CERTIP and ESPCP, it's this list of you know, several dozen PFAS compounds. Um, uh, but you may need to expand that list to think about, you know, also be thinking about the PFA precursors or looking at total fluorine or fluorinated organic compounds as a way to assess and demonstrate that the decrease in target PFAS is from you know, kind of in a perspective of a mass balance approach, that it is from um, destruction or the mechanism that you're interested in, maybe that sorption, rather than some of these other common losses like precursor transformation can be happening as well. Um, you can have sorption and desorption from surfaces, um, partitioning into air water interfaces, et cetera. So looking at this, not just from um, measuring PFAS concentrations in solution, but presenting evidence that shows that it's, um, you know, trying to close the PFAS mass balance and providing controls that um, have considered some of these common uh, reasons for, for gains and losses from the system. A uh, second line of evidence has to do with a mechanism. So, um, is there a plausible mechanism that's been identified that's consistent with what's already known about the chemistry of PFAS? Maybe the mechanism's already kind of known or proven and demonstrated from other compounds like sequestration. Um, <clears throat> in, in a lot of the research projects, the focus really is on what is the evidence, you know, is there some evidence that treatment is occurring according to this proposed mechanism? Um, so, if you're talking about destruction, it's sometimes useful to have kind of a, a research researcher's understanding, level of understanding of what are the destructive mechanisms that have been published to date and have been accepted for various PFAS compounds. And we talk at length about that in the final report and in our fact sheet um, with a focus on chemical oxidation, chemical reduction using solvate, via solvated electrons and uh, also thermal incineration. Third line of evidence is for really focused on destructive technologies. And that is what's the evidence that, that, that transform, you know, have transformation products been identified and quantified? 
Um, and this is important for from the perspective of the first two lines of evidence for closing the mass balance and understanding the mechanism. Um, also, you know, detecting, so are we detecting the expected transformation products and is the detection of those consistent with the mechanism? And then I think that, you know, there's other transformation products or byproducts that can come up as a result of applying the treatment technology. Um, and that might be sort of an unintended byproduct of the treatment process. And those need to be considered as well. So, for example, if there's a technology that's relying on a pH change in situ, you might end up with metals mobilization. Um, some of the electrochemical approaches um, have shown to form perchlorate. Um, so these are just you know things that you'd want to assess during the research stage and figure out how to manage before it gets to pilot and field scale. So these three factors were described in a technology evaluation checklist. And this is basically a tool that's meant to help facilitate a review of a particular technology and to make note of any areas where the technology has been demonstrated to be effective or have promise compared to areas where there's really no information and maybe a data gap or uncertainty and, and to help researchers to identify priorities for future research. And the checklist is really meant to help the user kind of go through that thought process and consider each of these issues. And then there's a, a notes or explanation field where you can provide some clarifying information or citations to key studies. Um, but one of the drawbacks, I think, is that it is a lengthy process and it requires some familiarity with the literature. So it's a good tool for a researcher, but in terms of someone who's just trying to understand like how well is this technology working, it may raise more questions than it answers. So what we had planned to do is to complete some of these checklists for these developing technologies. Um, we have a, a call out for volunteers to do that. So if you are working on a particular research technology and would like to contribute and kind of uh, uh, share your knowledge of where these technologies are, I think having these compiled um, would be really useful for the general community as well. Um, but so far the reviewers have found that that we have worked with have found that it's really useful to have this kind of checklist available to at least prompt some some questions in their minds and try to strengthen the design of research studies that are coming down the line. Uh, we also identified some best practices for all research studies to be using, um, particularly this would be useful for academics that are coming to the, the topic of PFAS from an, another background and they're bringing their expertise from somewhere other than kind of environmental chemistry. And there can be a learning curve when you're first working with PFAS in terms of, you know, the analytical methods, um, data reproducibility. Um, and then there's the need for standardization, for example, from CERTIP and ESTCP, they're working with a lot of different university labs. Um, and so they have their own guidance out in terms of what analytical requirements, the, their funded PFAS researchers need to, to be meeting, um, and they request confirmation of analytical results from an uh, accredited commercial laboratory. They request the standard operating procedures from the university laboratory. Uh, again, the goal is just to have uh, confidence in the study results and, and to know that we're comparing apples to apples. Um, and then other best practices, a lot of these studies, at least in the early stages, are conducted in, in triplicate or, or uh, just to reduce the, the um, level of variability and have sound data. And, and then there's a, a lot of thought that goes into the design of the controls to understand the proposed mechanisms um, and to demonstrate those from a scientific perspective to look at some of these potential losses from PFAS and to design to under, you know, to, to know in the end whether or not the results you're getting are because of the, the method, mechanism that you're trying to test or if you're going to end, end up with something that's more ambiguous as a result. Um, so the controls is really to reduce the amount of variability. And there's typically a progression when you're working on technology development in the lab from kind of a proof of concept level where the conditions are highly controlled and they're not 
particularly complex, you might be using like ultra pure water that's spiked with one or two compounds and testing that out. And once you're getting some demonstrating that the proof of concept that you're working on, then introducing some additional variables, seeing the effects of you know synthetic or, or natural groundwater, for example, working at more environmentally relevant uh, PFAS concentrations. And that there is this sort of evolution that we'd expect from a research perspective as we're developing these treatment technologies and moving them toward the field scale. But we also recognize that not all of our PFAS technologies go through this process. You know, sometimes we can have technology that's working well for something else and people are trying it out on PFAS because PFAS is there as well. Um, you can have consultants or vendors that have conducted some studies of their own and measure a decrease in concentrations and, and just starting to push out those results and attract additional interest in it for developing it. So the checklist reminds us to go back and kind of check off these um, kind of proof of concept boxes. Where are we with, with establishing whether or not this treatment technology is working? And then finally, we identified some, um, some additional considerations that can affect treatment system efficacy. So the you know testing these um, at relevant concentrations in the to so relevant concentrations of PFAS relevant mixtures um, under conditions where there might be a, a range of different PFAS compounds that are not always present at all of these sites or co-contaminants like chlorinated solvents and fuels that commonly show up at AFFF sites. Um, looking at some of the conditions that can impact removal in a real world setting, so the presence of competing ions or um, swings in pH or temperature or ionic strength. And really, it's kind of an, maybe an art for figuring, for researchers to figure out which of these factors do they focus on testing in the laboratory since there are often so many different variables. So consideration for them um, would be to prioritize some of these factors that could provide insight into the treatment mechanism or to be representative of conditions that are similar to the technology applications that they're envisioning. Um, and sometimes we can learn from, you know, technology that have been applied to address other contaminants and, you know, what factors affected feasibility there. Uh, as I mentioned, we have fact sheets on each of these topics that are going to be posted on the sort of website along with the final report. Um, and if you're interested in getting a copy of that before the publication, you can let me know. So with the last um, time that we have remaining here, I just want to describe one example of a novel treatment approach that's being developed with some funding from CERDIP. The CERDIP is provided funding for demonstrating proof of concept. It's typically early stages of testing. So far, the results have been really promising. Um, this is a photocatalytic approach with UV activation that's being led by a Dr. Megan Hart at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. <clears throat> and much of the project so far has been focused on kind of material science improvements developing a reproducible way of creating <clears throat> this photocatalytic material as a porous medium with a photocatalyst kind of embedded in a cross-linked structure. You're getting really good results now using a silica gel-based granular media. The material costs are low, it's scaling up well. Um, one of the other advantages of this technology is that the energy requirements are fairly low. So they're using UV to activate the photocatalyst, but it's much lower energy than would be required compared to like E-beam or you know, gamma radiation, some of the other approaches that have been used in the research to generate these solvated electrons to kind of initiate the process for breaking down the PFAS. Um, another promising um, concept is that this does not require elevated temperature or pressure. So compared to something like <clears throat> hydrothermal treatment or um, I know like chemical oxidation, extremely low pH has been tried. It has promise for having a relatively low carbon footprint and relatively low uh, cost as well. Um, right now, the residence time that's required for the complete destruction is you know, 30 minutes or more, depending on the mixture of the PFAS tested. And this 
process forms the shorter chain byproducts. Those are formed during degradation, and then there's more time required to degrade those as well. But <coughs> so far, results are promising. So starting with 50 milligram per liter of PFAS, running it through this filter media, and then coming out with non-detect concentrations after about 30 minutes of contact time. Currently, in this, in the, they're in the stage of kind of testing out this technology on different PFAS waste streams and media, so looking at dilute or, or concentrated AFFF stock mixtures, um, storm water we provided that was in contact with an, an AFFF usage area, and ion exchange still bottoms, um, landfill leachate. So it's, it's definitely an exciting time for research and uh, we hope that these investments that we're making today are gonna pay off in the future. We're seeing a lot of investments at the lab scale. Um, at this point, still only a few of them have been field demonstrated. And so it may be a question of just kind of finding the right niche for, you know, in the market for these technologies relative to some of the established sequestration technologies like granular activated carbon. <clears throat> so just to summarize, I talked about PFAS as being a complex group of compounds with some still evolving regulatory requirements, <clears throat> um, including, you know, some of the difficulties were the complex mixtures, precursor degradation, and analytical limitations, and then the changing or uncertain regulatory targets. Um, for established technologies, we're typically using GAC and ion exchange systems. We've seen some evolution of that approach over the past few years, um, better cost and performance models. But again, these technologies are <clears throat> well established and they, they work well. They can remove PFAS to meet these low effluent re requirements reliably. As long as we were putting in the, the um, effort up front to you know, correctly assess treatment requirements and, and design um, with regard to the site-specific water quality. Um, <clears throat> and then we talked about, you know, some of the um, new frontiers would be applying these techniques to stormwater that's still kind of an emerging need and less pra not practiced as frequently. Um, some of the concentrated wastes that are produced by sequestration and ongoing lab research to kind of develop better destructive technologies that could be used a, in a, as a treatment train approach. There's also a lot of interest in developing in situ treatment options and kind of assessing some of the long-term treatment system performance of in situ sequestration techniques. <clears throat> and then with the advent of these new you know, treatment technologies comes the question of how do we assess their efficacy? And I described the lines of evidence approach that has been developed for that purpose and, and then just provided an example of the photocatalytic destructive process that has been working well to degrade the concentrated PFAS. So with that, I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to present today and thank you all for your um, interest. Um, uh, back to you, Jason. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, uh, there are obviously uh, treatment options out there. Um, I want to move to a little bit of q and A. I have, we have a situation today where we ran a little bit long and I've got a whole bunch of questions. That's awesome. The audience is fully engaged and everything. Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to get to everybody's questions. I appreciate uh, Dr. Stapleton's been going through in the chat and picking off and answering the ones that were directed directly at her. Uh, and that was helpful. That saved us a little time. Thank you, Dr. Stapleton. Um, let me uh, pick out a few and see that maybe Dr. Stapleton didn't cover that came in later on. And uh, maybe at the end of after picking out a few questions, I do want to wrap this up before too long. Uh, we can put uh, Dr. Stapleton's and Elizabeth's uh, 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 email addresses out there in the chat. If you'd be willing to do that, I noticed you had Elizabeth. You had yours on your last slide, anyway. I can't remember if you did, Heather. But if you would put your email addresses out there, maybe some of the questions we didn't get to, people will send to you. Uh, 
I had one to begin with. Obviously, there are treatment options, but you know some of the current ones going on, like uh, granular granular activated carbon and things like that, they're expensive. And so uh, I understand that there's a wide array of uses for these PFAS compounds. And obviously the cheapest uh, way to treat them is to not use them or create them in the for first place, to, to eliminate them at the source. Uh, and I'll ask this question to either or both of you. Have we been making any progress toward reducing the use of these chemicals? Is there, are, are we developing substitutes or, or finding ways around that? Um, I, I can start and then you can add in, Heather, if you want your information on that. But I think there's definitely been a big push to try to come up with suitable alternatives, but that, um, that the PFAS firefighting foams work really well. And so when it comes, it comes to, you know, needing to put out fires within a short amount of time and save lives or prevent a, a fire at a fuel, fuel tank from spreading and um, causing a lot more damage. I know that, that some of our clients would say it's worth it for the, the health and safety risk that it provides, despite this environmental legacy that they're left with in the end and this, you know, multi-year project of containing it. Um, but there's certainly a, a need for better alternatives to be developed. Um, and I know that CERTIF is also funding that. There's been some webinars in their series on fluorine-free foams and their efficacy. Heather, did you have anything to add to that? No, I'll just add that um, I am aware of there are fluorine free options for AFFF, the firefighting foam that are now on the market, um, which seem to have a better environmental profile. So I think there's a lot of interest in moving away from the fluorine based uh, firefighting foams and moving to these more novel, greener technologies. Uh, so hopefully we can see more of that in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to pick a couple questions here from the list. I don't think we have time, but for two, there was one we uh, that we skipped over. What is the potential for aerosols of these contaminants to, to surface waters? I understood that to be an issue for the Comores contamination. <clears throat> well, certainly, uh, I'll ask Elizabeth to comment too. Um, so most of the PFAS I was referring to, like these legacy PFAS, they're ionic in nature. So they're not going to volatilize. They're not going to be found at appreciable levels in the air. There are some uh, what we call precursors, PFOS precursors. So they have different functional groups. Um, they look a little bit different. And they can be transformed into something. So at Keymores, it was a precursor that would hydrolyze in the rain to form Gen X. And so then there was some atmospheric transport and delivery to groundwater in a spatial pattern that was of concern. But most of the PFAS that are of concern for human health are not volatile. Elizabeth, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, thanks, Heather. Uh, a question for Elizabeth, are the ecotoxicity levels provided on the stormwater figure based on fish or macroinvertebrates? That should be an easy one. Um, I don't actually know the answer to that. I know that these are values from the CERTIP report and I can provide the link to that and you can look into it in more detail. Uh, it should be an easy one, but I'm just not the right person to answer that question. I'm sorry. Uh, what is the mechanism associated with PFAS reduction for in situ injection? Is it actually breaking down or just sorbing onto the soils? Yeah, for in situ injection, it really is just the sorption that is the the target mechanism. Um, so it's, it's not a destructive technology. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any um, uh, approaches that have tried to be destructive, like once it's been sequestered, try to be destructive in situ. I think that would require then taking that media that where the PFAS has been sequestered, taking that out of the, you know, and, and then it becomes an ex situ approach for disposal. Okay. Uh, one last question. I'm going to jump here and, uh, and then we'll uh, move on to a couple of announcements. Is the only way for PFAS blood levels to decrease through breakdown or is it transported out of the body by other means? That's probably one for you to start with, Heather. Yeah, no, I did reply to that one in the chat. I know it might have got oh, missed. Oh, did you? But, um, okay. Yep. 
okay, yeah, they, never mind. they are excreted. Um, it's just a very, very slow process resulting in long half-lives. Okay. With that, thank you. I'm sorry I missed that you'd gotten that one already. Uh, with that, I want to move on to a couple of quick announcements and then we'll wrap this up to be, you know, be mindful of everybody's time. Uh, Heather and Elizabeth both posted their email addresses in the chat stream. So uh, feel free if we didn't get to your questions to email them those questions by all means. Uh, wanted to put in a plug for our next uh, forum like this is going to be May 6th. And that's going to be Dr. Chrissy Hopkins from NC State uh, talking about rethinking stormwater in our neighborhoods. Please be on the lookout for that. I'm sure you'll get the email notices and, uh, and register accordingly. I uh, just want to give everybody a heads up. Uh, we have been updating our technologies at NCWRA. Uh, many of you, if you when you registered for this event, saw that we have a new really cool website and a new logo. We're excited about both of those things. Uh, one of those switches, though, I wanted to give everybody a little heads up on is that our membership management system, uh, we, we you know, have a subscription service for that. They are no longer going to use PayPal for payment processing, and they're gonna have their own, in, where they've rolled out their own internal directly connected uh, payment system. I can't recall the name of it right off the top of my head. It will make life easier for us uh, in terms of the integration of uh, registration fees and payments coming in and our, and our ability to track all that and make sure we have everything together. But it will require you as our members and event uh, participants to uh, take a moment to register with a new payment system on our website. So, but we still will be, be able to take payments on the web because that made it a lot easier when we made that switch a few years ago. Uh, with that, Anna, uh, do you have anything else to add? And I'll, if not, I'll wrap it up. Hi, guys. This is Anna Martin. I just want to say thank you to both uh, Dr. Stapleton and Elizabeth for joining us today. It was a great presentation. We did record the session today, and I know there were a handful of uh, snafus with folks who may not have been able to join right at the start time. So please just email me if you have any follow-up questions. Um, I'm happy to provide a link on what Zoom processes this recording. It will take a few hours to possibly a day, but um, we are happy to make that available if you weren't able to join on time. I've provided uh, the link to the evaluation. Again, we, we do value your feedback and uh, would love to hear your thoughts on future forum topics or speakers. And uh, that's all I've got, Jason. Thank you so much for excellent moderation today. Uh, thank you. And I'll echo the thanks to our speakers today. Thank you all very much for taking out the time and, and putting in the effort. That was fascinating stuff. Uh, and we'll be in touch. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.